Are you guys ready to get into the Word of God today? We're going to do a little study today. Is that okay? So you guys got to stay with me. Amen? Amen. All right, let's do something. I've only done this once before. We're going to do it again. Take out your Bibles or whatever you're reading the Bible with. And if you don't have one, take the one right in front of you. Take it out and raise it high. Raise it high, raise it high. Repeat after me. I'm armed. And I'm dangerous. That's your weapon right there. Heavenly Father, Lord, before we open up our word, we need your spirit. We, we know, Lord, we know, Lord, that uh, you are especially with us and especially want to speak to us when we open up your word. So, Lord, we're ready. We surrender. We're here. And you're here. And so speak to our hearts and minds today, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Don't you hate when you're talking to someone and you're looking at them and you're having this conversation, maybe you haven't seen them in a while, and you can't remember their name? Oh, I hate that. It's so frustrating to me because I really try to take some time to know people's names and to learn people's names. I'm still learning a lot of names here, so please be patient. I know a lot of names here, but, um, but I hate that. I hate when I'm talking to someone and I forget their name, so you guys understand what I'm saying. Why is it so important to remember someone's name? Well, someone's name obviously is identification, right? So we know them and uh, we identify them by their name. It's what identifies you. But in ancient times, a name was more than that. A name was your essence. A name describes you. A name was what you were all about. What you are all about. It's your identity rather than just your identification. You guys with me so far? It's your identity more than just your identification. You know, when, when Moses asks God, what is your name in Exodus chapter 3, God replies what? I am that I am. In other words, I will be what I will be. And if you look at that closely in Exodus chapter 3, Moses isn't really asking God what his name was. He was really asking God what he was like. So a name is more than just your identification, it's your identity. If you ever want to do a study that'll blow your mind, you study scripture, look at the names of God in scripture. And, and man, you want your mind to be blown, just look at the names of God in scripture and you will see that God has several names and they are names according to his characteristics, according to his quality. So you have all these names of God. I just put that up there for a few moments because I really want to get to our point here in the book of Ruth. So with all this information about names and how important that is, I really want us to get into a study of the book of Ruth. By the way, just to give you an example that nowadays we name, our names are not really our qualities or our characteristics. Um, I'll give you an example. My name. Glenn. You guys know what Glenn means? It means valley. And if you were here last week, you understand what a valley in in the Bible symbolizes versus a mountain. And so my name is kind of depressing, actually. And I don't think I'm a depressing person, but that's my name. It doesn't really, it just describes, it just identifies me, but it doesn't describe me. What does describe us sometimes is nicknames. So I was growing up, my brother, who looks just like me, but he's six feet tall, So he was Big G, because his name was Greg, and I was Little G. (laughs) So a nickname may describe us, a nickname may uh, identify us, uh, but uh, names nowadays, sometimes they don't. So with all that said, with all that said, let's go to the book of Ruth, chapter 1. Again, just warning you, this is a little bit of a study more than it is a sermon, so please stay with me, okay? Stay with me. Ruth, chapter 1. One. And while you're turning there, let me tell you the story of Ruth chapter 1. So in Ruth chapter 1, it opens up with a family. And you have a man and his wife. The man's name is Elimelech. And his wife, his name is Naomi. And so you have two. And then they had two sons. Doesn't really say their name, I don't think. But then you had the two sons each had a wife. And so you got six. Six people so far in this family, but in Ruth chapter 1, it's kind of a sad story. Elimelech passes away. It doesn't really say why, but Elimelech passes away. So now you have five. You have a widow, Naomi, her two sons, and her two daughters. Well, the sad story continues, and not just Elimelech passes away. Now you have their two sons who pass away. Now you just have 
three, you have Naomi, and you have Orpah, and you have Ruth, her daughter-in-laws. And so you look at this story, it's kind of a sad story. In fact, speaking of the names, Naomi's name means joy. I thought of Auntie Naomi. Is she here today? Auntie Naomi, did you know that your name means joy? And your daughter is joy. I thought that was really cool. Did you do that on purpose? No? Okay, now you know. And so uh, uh, Naomi means joy. And then at the end of chapter 1, she changes her name to Mara. And Mara means sorrow. It means sorrow. And so you obviously see Ruth chapter 1. It's a sad, sad story. And so you look at the book of Ruth. You look at Ruth chapter 1. And Naomi now, she's lost her husband. She's lost her two sons. So she gathers her daughters. And she essentially says to them in Ruth chapter 1, you girls have been so good to me. I love you like my daughters. You guys have been so good to me, but I have no more sons to give to you. And if you stay with me, there's no future for you. So you have my blessing. If you want to leave, you can leave. Verse 14 of Ruth chapter 1 says that Orpah kisses her mother-in-law and she leaves. But verse 14, it says that Ruth does what? Ruth clings. Before we go to our key verses in verse 16 and 17, let's get some details of this story. I think this is very important for us to know. The book of Ruth comes after what book in the Bible, church? Please tell me. Judges. Now, some people will, will think... You know, the books of the Bible, they were just kind of randomly chosen. Oh, let's just put Genesis there and Revelation here and Matthew right here in the middle and maybe Isaiah and Jeremiah. That sounds good. Let's put it there. But we believe that books of the Bible weren't randomly chosen, that God had a specific reason why he put them where they are. Do you guys believe that? And we believe that Ruth was placed right after Judges because Ruth and Judges are direct contrast to each other. You guys still with me? So Judges, we'll look at it real quick. Um, let, me, let me show you what I mean. Judges, if you look at the book of Judges, it's all about history, Israel's history, their wars. It's a violent. Actually, if you look at Judges, there are some stories in there that you'd be like, oh, that's gross. Is that in the Bible? Check, I promise you, check it out. It's crazy. It's bloody. Violent. You have heroes and villains in Judges. You have national endeavors. You have national pride in the book of Judges. And by contrast to Judges, all of a sudden, boom, you got Ruth. In fact, it's a continuation. It's so obvious when you see Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. It's so, it's so obvious that it's a continuation of Judges. And Ruth is not about Judges. Ruth is a story of home. It's about relationships. It's about family. It's about marriage. It's about love. And so Ruth and Judges is totally, totally opposite. Total contrast. I want you to notice something else with me in the book of Ruth. Ruth is mentioned many times, speaking of names, to carry this name, to carry this title. She is called, and it's on purpose, for a purpose. It's repeated many times, you can see it, in Ruth. She is Ruth the Moabitess. Ruth the Moabitess. Ruth the Moabitess. Okay, we get it. We get it, writer. We get it. She's given this name. It's clear. She's given this name. This is her label. Have you guys ever been given a label? Most of the time when we're given labels, they're negative. (laughs) The last time I was given a label, I was in Florida fishing with my brother and this big Korean guy. Let me tell you how big this guy is. He used to play play linebacker in the University of Florida. And we were there. We were fishing on a pier in Florida. And this kid said something to us about our ethnicity. And let me tell you, it was an ugly label. And my friend... All six foot two of him used to be linebacker for University of Florida. He almost took this kid and threw him over the pier. It was that serious. And and, and none of us like labels. But if you think about Ruth's story, she was given this label. And church family, it's a negative label. Ruth, the Moabitess. It's a a label. It's It's a name that no one wanted to be called back then, and it was on purpose, for a purpose here in Scripture. She was a Moabitess. The Hebrew writer stresses her origin time after time, and we can't miss it. And by the way, whenever you have repetition in the Bible, it means what? Something's very important, right? 
Repetition is the key to learning. And repetition in the Bible means, hey, something's important. God is trying to show us something here. And here it is. Here's the meaning. Ruth didn't belong. She was an outsider. She was not part of the family. She didn't have the right nationality. She didn't have the right blood. Ruth, the Moabites. Let me give you some facts about the Moabites. In Numbers 25, the men of Israel, it says that they committed harlotry with the women of Moab. So it means that they looked at these ladies, they looked at these people, they thought of them as unworthy, unholy, lower than them, a lower class. You look at 2 Kings chapter 3, Israel and Moab, they were bitter enemies. Throughout history, they're bitter enemies. 1 Chronicles 18, the Moabites were their servants. Another way to put servants, slaves. So obviously these people, the Moabites, were not looked at well. They were lower class. They were unholy. They were unworthy. They, were, they, they didn't have right to be in the family. Ruth, the Moabites. You guys get the picture? Are you guys still with me? So let's get back to the story. Here's our key verse. Ruth chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. I really want you guys to see this. Please, please see this. These words are so important. Here we are. Ruth chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. And I know we just read that. But we're going to read it again. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts you and me. Man, you look at this story of Ruth Hinsdale Philem and you will see that Ruth is a woman of faith. And how do we know it? We know this because one, she chose to love the God of Israel even though she wasn't an Israelite. Number two, she chose to love and stay with Naomi even though she had all the right to leave. And number three, she was a woman of faith because she chose to love Boaz even though she knew that he wasn't supposed to love her. If you ever want to read an awesome love story, read the rest of Ruth. I invite you to, please. We're not going to talk about the love story here today. We're just talking about Ruth chapter 1. But this is how we know Ruth is a woman of faith. She chose to do all these things. And it shows that she was a woman of faith. Can you imagine? Imagine for a minute. Not growing up in a certain religion. But you spend enough time in that religion that that religion becomes your own. Can you can you imagine not growing up in a certain belief system, but you spend enough time with people of that belief system that you start adopting that belief system and that belief system becomes your own. You may not look like it. And people may not consider you a part of it, but deep down inside you are. I tell you something, church. And this is not to put anyone down. It's just what I've seen in the last 15 years of ministry. But why are the strongest Adventist Christians the ones that didn't grow up as Adventist Christians? Have you seen that too? I'm just telling you what I've seen. I'm just telling you what I've seen. And by the way, I'm not saying that I like that. I'm saying by God's grace, that's got to change. But I've seen that the strongest Adventist Christians are not the ones that grown up as Adventist Christians. And by the way, I know I'm speaking in generality, so please forgive me. I'm just telling you what I've seen. In fact, I'll give you an example that's very close to home. And my wife doesn't mind me sharing her story. But my wife didn't grow up in this church. She didn't grow up in this church. That may surprise some of you. She was baptized when she was in college. But let me tell you something. Even though I'm the one up here, make no mistake, when it comes to being Adventist, she is a lot stronger than me. My mother-in-law, she was just baptized a few years ago. You know that 
From week to week, she is on the phone talking to people about her faith, explaining to them and explaining to them how we believe about the Sabbath and how we believe about our health message. You know that? I don't know other people who do this. And I'm telling you, I'm not, I, 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 again, I'm not trying to judge anyone, but I just happen to see that the strongest Adventist Christians I know didn't grow up as Adventist Christians. Ruth was a woman of faith. She wasn't born in it. She chose it. And by the way, let me say this to all those who are like me, who are born in it. One day, one day, if you are born in it like me, one day you have to choose it. You were born in it, but one day you have to choose it. Oh, I hope someone's listening to me here today. Just like others who didn't grow up and have to choose it, we have to choose it too. But Ruth was given a name, a label that placed her on the outside, but her faith placed her on the inside. In other words, on the outside, she wasn't a part of God's people, but on the inside, in her heart, she was. It didn't matter what her title was. It didn't matter. What mattered was that deep inside, she knew who she was. She was a child of the one true God. What the gospel in Ruth is doing is this, church family. Please catch this. It's starting to break down barriers. The gospel in Ruth is, try, is starting to introduce that there are man-made traditions out there. There are man-made prejudice out there, and it's starting to put them away. There's the gospel in Ruth, and I want you to see it from my favorite author. Oh, that's not, that is kind of dark. I hope you guys can see it. I'll read it for you, and you see the, and you see the uh, resource anyway if you want to look at it. And, and she says this, these Seem the object of the book of Ruth. Well, this, listen, to this, because this is kind of heavy theology, so, so please stay with me. We'll explain it later. The book of Ruth, to present a supplement by way of contrast to the book of Judges. Again, the contrast to Judges. To show the true spirit of Israel, to exhibit once more the mysterious connection between Israel and the Gentiles. The book of Ruth stands on the threshold of the history of David, not merely on account of the genealogy of Christ, which leads up to David and Boaz, but on account of the spirit which the teaching of David breathes. Do we love to remember that Israel's great king sprang from the union of Boaz and Ruth, which is David. David came from the union between Boaz and Ruth, which is symbolic, symbolical of that between Israel and the Gentile world. Now, I know that's kind of heavy theology. You guys can... can, can uh, can take a picture and look at it later. But this is what she is saying. What is she saying? She's saying this right here. Here, let me, let me capture you back. Ruth, this story, this, the history of this story is about the true spirit of the gospel. How people on the outside by faith can become people on the inside. The book of Ruth is about how anyone by faith, Jew or Gentile, can become part of God's family. The book of Ruth is echoing the great theme of the Bible, how because of sin, we are outside of God's family, but because of our Redeemer, we can be a part of the family of God. That's the book of Ruth. And Ruth is especially written for all those who feel like they don't belong. Let me say that again. Ruth is especially written for people who don't feel like they belong. In Matthew chapter 1, in Matthew chapter 1 verse 5, actually is the lineage of Jesus, and we see a name there, and it's on purpose for a purpose. We see Ruth. She's part of the lineage of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. In fact, if you look at the lineage of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1, surprise, surprise, you will see adulterers, you will see murderers, you will see thieves and you will see liars. And guess what, church family? All part of the lineage of Jesus. Because anybody, anybody by faith can be a part of God's family. That's the book of Ruth and that's the point. Church family, no matter who you are, no matter what title you've been given, and no matter what label you carry, there is room in the family of God for you. You know, this is nothing I am proud of. 
But when I changed my major at Southern to become a theology major, I uh, was asked to play on the theology basketball team. They needed help, and they, you know, they, they saw all, all six foot five of me, and they thought, man, we need this guy. Actually, I say six foot five because you put those numbers opposite, and actually that's my height. So, but anyway, I was asked to be a part of the basketball team. And I thought, of course I'll play on the theology basketball team. I had no idea, coach, that there would be a target on our back. You see, I didn't know this because I, th- I, I was a pre-dentistry major. I didn't know that th- the theology team had a, had a target on their back. So the theology team, they were not supposed to be competitive. They were not supposed to win. No one expected us to win. And no one expected us to play with an edge. But I was 21 years old and I played with all those things. I wanted to win. I wanted to play and to win, and I had an edge. And so this is the record that I hold, I still hold at Southern. I'm not proud of it, but it's still true to this day. I hope no one ever, no, no one ever breaks my record. I hope never. But I was the first and only theology student to ever get kicked out of a basketball game. <laughs> and so there was one game in particular. I thought the refs were doing a horrible job, and I let them know. Hey, I didn't call it. I didn't foul him. Or I would argue, I would argue so much that my temper got me kicked out of a basketball game. I could just imagine someone on the stands that day when I was kicked out and I was asked to leave the game. I could just, I could just imagine someone saying, there goes the future pastor. Good luck, Hinsdale. <laughs> And I think, I think of, like, when I, especially when I first started, and man, God has a lot of work still to do in my life, but especially when I first started, when I was 21, started studying this, God really had some work in me to do. And I'm so thankful. That's why I'm so thankful for the gospel. Ruth, the Moabitess, Ruth, the Moabitess, became... The great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus Christ. Glenn, the only theology student to ever get kicked out of a game in, bas- in, in Southern's basketball history. The, the cheater and the liar and the thief became Glenn, the disciple of Jesus. I know some of you have that story as well. That's why I love the gospel. Let me tell you something, church. Don't ever forget it because it could be perhaps life and death to you. It may be the most important thing that someone ever can tell you, and it's this. No matter who you are, no matter what title you've been given, no matter what label you've been carrying, there is room in the family of God for you. That's why Ephesians chapter 2 verse 19 says, You are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of what, church? God's household. 1 John 3 verse 1. Little kid, little, I, I remember learning this as a little kid. Do you guys remember this song? Hey, if you remember it, sing it with me. Behold what manner of love the Father. Oh, you guys know it. Yeah, you guys know it. Come on, come on. Let me hear you. That? Wow. I hear some bass. I hear some medley. I love it. I love it. I see some harmony. Ooh, you guys sound good. Church family, that's your true label. That's your true name right here. Members of God's household called the sons and daughters of God. Don't you ever forget it. By faith, you and I get what we don't deserve. That we can be called children of God. You are a child of God. Ruth chapter 4, verse 13. Watch this, watch this. Here's the point of the whole book of Ruth. If you want to know what the book of Ruth is all about, here it is right here. 
I've, I, I heard you tell, you heard me say, you say it over and over and over again. Her name is Ruth the Moabitess. Ruth the Moabitess. It's on purpose for a purpose. But in the end of Ruth, in Ruth chapter 4 verse 13, she has a new name. And her new name is Ruth, the wife of Boaz. She belonged. She became a part of the family. No matter who you are, no matter what label you've carried, No matter what title you've been given, there is room in the family of God for you. And if that's true, if that is true, Hinsdale Philam, if that is true, then how should we treat people that are on the inside or on the outside, I should say? Let me say it again. If this is true, then how should we treat people who are on the outside? Come on, I need to hear it from you guys. Like family. How should we treat people who are on the outside? Like children of God. I love this quote. You have never looked into the face of another person that is not an image bearer of God. No one. We're the ones who have that pretend wall and who think people are on the outside. I love this quote too. If you are not concerned about your neighbor's salvation, then I am concerned for yours. If this is true, church family, how do we treat those on the outside? I heard a story on the radio I thought was so good. I had to take notes about it. You see, there's this uh, lady whose name is Ruth, by the way, in New Jersey, She retired as a teacher, and uh, she's a devout Christian, and she said to herself, she says, "Um, God, uh, now that I'm retired, I I know you want me to do something for you. I I know that there's still a place that that you want me to serve, and so um, she prays about it, and she says says that God gave her this answer. He says, um, he said to her, Ruth, You are a kind person. That's your gift. You're a generous person. So she decides, you know what I'm going to do now that I'm retired? I'm going to do a a, a random act of kindness every single day. I'm going to do, just randomly do something for someone every single day. And that prayer was answered. One day she was at a gas station called Wawa. Now you guys may not know Wawa, but those of us who are in Florida, and Justin's going to love Wawa because Wawa has great sandwiches, Justin, by the way. This, this, this gas station called Wawa. And Wawa's a very, very, like, it's like a really, really famous place. And so she's there, and she's in the back of the line, waiting in line, because this guy in the front, this raggedy-haired guy, who looks like he's kind of a bum kind of looking guy, um, he's going, and he, 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 he doesn't have enough change to pay for his coffee. So he sees she sees this guy, and she's, he's just fuddling around. He doesn't have enough change for his coffee. So Ruth says, ah, oh, here's my random act of kindness. And so she goes to the front. She says, sir, 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 let me pay for this. Boom, pays for his coffee. He leaves, and she pays for his, her stuff too. And She goes outside to the parking lot, and lo and behold, there's this guy, and he's waiting for her. And he comes up to her and he thanks her. He's like, thank you so much for doing that for me. No one's, re- no one's ever really done that for me before. And, she, and, and he looks at her like just square, right, right here. And he says, ma'am, do you know who I am? And now she's looking at him closely. She goes, whoa, are you that singer? And she says, what's your name? And he goes, my name is Keith. Keith Urban. If you're a country singer, you know who this is? Or a country, country music fan, you will know who this is? But I'm not much of a country music fan, so I didn't know who this was. I just like the story. And so she finds out that this is, lo and behold, this is Keith Urban. And they're like, and, she, and he's like, hey, by the way, I'm doing a concert here. Would you like to come? So they, become, they like take pictures, and he invites her to the concert. She's like his special guest. I just thought, man, that is so cool. She happened to be Keith Urban. That is really cool. Just by doing something so simple. 
and yet so meaningful. And I keep thinking of this story in Ruth. If the gospel is true, Hinsdale Philam, how do we treat those who don't look like they belong? How do we treat those who may look like they're on the outside? We treat them just like she did, not because they're Keith Urban. And we treat others like she did because they are the image bearer of God. So we've talked a lot about names today. We've talked about the meanings of names. But there is no greater name than the name that's above all names. And Hillary and Justin are going to do a song that sings about this name. And I know this is going to bless you. So please, please put your hearts into this song with me as we hear this today.